In the great controversy, page 234 and 235, Mrs. White solidifies this idea of infiltration by describing a particular order of the Roman Catholic Church known as the Society of Jesus or Jesuits in these words. That's here, Great Controversy 234, 235. She says, at this time, that's August 15th, 1534, barely 17 years after Luther nailed his thesis on the castle church door and launched the Protestant Reformation, the order of the Jesuits was created. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Under various disguises, there's that word again, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations, end quote. If they can work their way into the offices of state and climb up to be counselors of kings, watch this, and shaping the policy of nations, how do you think or how hard do you think it would be for them to feign conversion and climb into God's church and end up sitting on committees such as the one that gave birth to this piece of deception, the great hope. In 1835, Professor Samuel Morse, we know him as the inventor of the Morse Code. He published a series of articles in the New York Observer that were eventually compiled into a book entitled Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States. On page 48, this is what he writes. Is it not in accordance with all experience of popish policy that Jesuits should encroach by little and little and persevere till they have attained to plenitude of power? At present, they have but one aim in this country, which absorbs all others, and that is to make themselves popular. If they succeed in this, we shall then learn, when too late to remedy the evil, that popery abandons none of its divine rights." End quote. Friend, the Jesuit penchant for disguise is legendary. There's a wonderful piece of correspondence which I alluded to at the top of this program between two former presidents of the United States. John Adams, that's the first vice president on the George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Adams ultimately became the second president of this country and Thomas Jefferson III. That is a highly instructive letter and I'll read it for you here. The first letter was written by Adams to Jefferson after the Jesuit order, which had been banned by Pope Clement XIV on the 21st of July, 1773 was reinstated by Pope Pius VII on the 7th of August, 1814. Adams is writing about the resurrection of the Jesuits, which everybody thought, everybody thought the order was dead because the Pope had banned them with an infallible decree. And here is another Pope undoing the infallible decree of a previous Pope. And Adams is writing Jefferson and he says, quote, I, do not like the resurrection of the Jesuits. They have a general now in Russia, in correspondence with the Jesuits in the United States, who are more numerous than everybody knows. Shall we not have swarms of them here in as many shapes and disguises as ever a king of the gypsies, Bamfield Moore Carew himself assumed, in the shape of printers, editors, writers, schoolmasters, etc. I have lately read Pascal's letters over again and four volumes of the history of the Jesuits. If ever any congregation of men could merit eternal perdition on earth and in hell, According to these historians, though like Pascal, true Catholics, it is this company of Loyola, our system, however, of religious liberty must afford them an asylum. But if they do not put the purity of our elections to a severe trial, it will be a wonder. 
May 6th, 1816, Jefferson responds, I know nothing of the history of the Jesuits you mention in four volumes. Is it a good one? I dislike with you their restoration because it marks a retrograde step from light towards darkness. Jefferson Zone is written on August the 1st, 1816. And let me tell you something. When I first contacted the Massachusetts Historical Society to find that letter, they didn't know that it existed. And I had read about it, so I knew it, its existence, and I was able to give the archivist the very date on which the letter was written, and she went back into it. Now, all of John Adams' letters, his letters to Jefferson are at the National Library or archives, and then the letters of Jefferson back to him are at the Massachusetts Historical Society, but you can still get carbon copies of the two-way correspondence. And they claimed it wasn't there, but when I asked her to dig on that certain date, she found it. And it's kind of not surprising that she didn't know it existed because based on today's standards, what was said was extraordinarily politically incorrect. But there were two former presidents talking frankly about the resurrection of the Jesuits and what it would mean for this country. This explosive bit of correspondence begs the question, what did Adams and Jefferson know about the Jesuits that prompted their mutual abhorrence of the order? We'll address this in a few minutes. For now, I'd like to limit our inquiry to two observations. First, what was Adams' reference to Bamfield Moore Carew all about? What was it intended to convey? Who was this man? Now, I'll tell you the truth. For years, I thought he was a king of the gypsies. That's what the letter said. But I decided to dig and went on the internet and went to encyclopedias and found out, as Adams had intimated, that Carew, Carew was no such king of the gypsies, but he was instead a British con man, a British con artist with a flair for, you guessed it, disguise. His memoirs entitled The Life and Adventures of Bamfield Moore Carew were first published in 1745 and continued to be a bestseller for over a hundred years. That's a con man writing. Referring to himself as the noted Devonshire stroller and dog stealer, Carew claimed during his numerous escapades to have masqueraded as a shipwrecked sailor, a clergyman, the mate of a vessel, and, quote, defrauding Squire Portman twice in one day, first as a rat catcher, and then a woman whose daughter had been killed in a fire. Bottom line, Carew was a master of disguise, and so are the Jesuits, which is the point Adams was making as he contemplated them swarming into the United States. We would do well to contemplate them swarming into our churches too. Now let's get to the question, what did they know? What did they know about the Jesuits to, to consign them to hell in this life and in the life to come? They were well-read men and former ambassadors to both Britain and France. Adams and Jefferson had to have known of the many attempts at overthrowing England's Queen Elizabeth by the likes of Jesuits Robert Parsons and Edmund Campion and others like Anthony Babington. We're talking about British history now whose plots had been thwarted by Elizabeth's top spy master, Sir Francis Walsingham. You can go on the internet and look him up, or go into Britannica Encyclopedia. Francis Walsingham. They also had to have known, I'm talking about Adams and Jefferson, had to have known about the attempt on the life of Elizabeth's successor, King James I, and the, the entire parliament at the infamous gunpowder plot of 1605. The British Parliament, after all, made that day of discovery a public holiday. And I'll explain in a minute what I mean by day of discovery. But it is observed to this day as Guy Fawkes Day. Years ago, I sent a cameraman over to Britain to capture some of the revelry associated with this day. I'd wanted to go, in fact, I'd still like to go, but I couldn't go at the time. But if you take a look at what we captured, that footage on your screen, you'll see that in some parts of Britain, the people have never quite forgotten what the Jesuits attempted to do to their beloved parliament. 
The day is still celebrated with the rolling of tar barrels and fireworks everywhere. Of course, those fireworks don't come close to matching the firepower with which Guy Fawkes was caught. On that day, Fawkes, working with the Supreme Jesuit of, the, of London, was caught sitting on 36 barrels of gunpowder under the British Parliament, which had they exploded as intended with the king in attendance later that day, would have sent everybody inside the building into eternity. There was a time when every British school child knew this little nursery rhyme. Please to remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. That's the nursery rhyme British children knew. Let's do it again. That's so cute. Please to remember the 5th of November. That's the date on which they caught Fox under Parliament. Gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Thank God the plot was discovered before it could materialize, for had the Jesuits succeeded in assassinating the king, not only would Parliament have been history, but planet Earth would have been deprived of one of its greatest treasures, this book, the King James Version of the Bible. That's the king who would have been inside Parliament that day, the successor to Queen Elizabeth I. Friend, the Vatican will stoop at nothing to conquer. If she has to blow up your parliament to bring in a new order of ruler, she'll do it. The British, wouldn't you know that in places like Lewis, that's the footage you're looking at, they still burn effigies of the Pope on Guy Fawkes Day. That's to this day. It might not be politically correct to do it, but they remember. The rest of the world might have forgotten what the Jesuits are all about, but they remember. They remember the attempt to blow up parliament. They remember how many people would have died. And so parliament decreed, you're gonna celebrate this annually. It was the first decree, the first holiday decreed so by parliament. You shall remember. You should plan a vacation and go and see it for yourself. November 5th, November 4th, go over to London, go to the town of Lewis. I haven't been able to go, but you go and take it in. All right, take it in before celebrations like what you're watching are banned. Guy Fawkes Day is the commemoration of just one of the more infamous escapades for which the Jesuits were known and about which Adams and Jefferson would have been quite familiar. Now, we're still talking about this book, The Great Hope, but I have to lay the groundwork and give you some history so that you can understand the nature of the minds with which we are contending when it comes to this scam. Besides this plot, that's the Guy Fawkes plot for which the Jesuit superior, Father Henry Garnett, and his accomplices were executed. And when I say father, please, I'm not sinning against God. I have inverted, um, inverted marks around my word father because the Bible tells me I should call no man father in a religious sense. So to me, he's really pastor Henry Garnet. He was executed. That's what the British did with him once they tortured people and found out who was behind this plot. These two signers of the Declaration of Independence, that's Adams and Jefferson, had to have known of the role of the Jesuits also in the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre as well. During this slaughter over in France, some 30,000 Protestants were slain. 
But we don't have time to go into that here. The gunpowder plot by itself will have to do for now as we try to explain why Adams in particular would write, quote, if ever any congregation of men could merit eternal perdition on earth and in hell, according to these historians, though like Pascal, true Catholics, it is this company of Loyola. That's Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order, end quote. As for that Pope who banned the Jesuits, he died a rather sudden death. Payback, it was commonly held, for his audacity in banning the holy order to begin with. You know something? There's an interesting story about the death of that Pope, Pope Clement, that begs to be told here. So once again, I'm just, I'm just laying the groundwork for a close look as to what's going on with this farce. All right, but let's learn a few lessons along the way. I know it might seem as though we're straying from the showdown between the great hope and the great controversy right now, but we really aren't. These chapters of Jesuit history are quite instructive. For not only do they remind us of what Protestants in bygone days faced from a Roman Catholicism that had its back against the wall after the Protestant Reformation had been unleashed, they bring Ellen White's dream about the confiscation of her books even more ominously to life. These chapters should remind us of the absolute commitment the order has to the original commission given them to spearhead the counter-reformation, that is, the undoing of all things Protestant. What credible source can verify what I've just told you? You can try Encyclopedia Britannica. For one, especially the editions written at the beginning of the 20th century, the modern day editions have, have been gutted. You go to what the old Britannica Encyclopedia had to say about the Jesuits. These chapters of Jesuit intrigue put a well-deserved coloring, I believe, over what is currently unfolding with the great controversy. Anyway, back to Pope Clement, the Pope who banned the Jesuits. On February 24th, 1889, the following appeared in the New York Times, bearing the headline, Was Pope Clement Poisoned? The death of Pope Clement XIV is a sample of the mysterious or unexplained. For, in spite of the glosses put forward by the historian of his pontificate, the circumstances attending it are still wrapped in obscurity. We have simply the following particulars to go upon. A watermelon is served up to the pontifical table. The taster opens it and cuts off a slice, which, as in duty bound, he eats. And we may suppose, as the fruit is a delicious one, enjoys. He wipes his knife on a napkin, cuts off another piece, and presents it to the Pope. All Popes had their tasters, you see. And the Pope partakes of this slice of watermelon and is straightway poisoned. Now it is assumed that the poison was administered in the form of a subtle powder which had been sprinkled on the napkin with which the taster wiped his knife after cutting the first and innocuous slice. This expedient, if actually adopted, was worthy of a country of the Borgias but obviously could not have been carried into effect without the connivance or assistance of members of the papal household. It is difficult to believe that the taster would have been ignorant of it, end quote. That's what the Jesuits are known for. That's what Adams and Jefferson knew. Murder, intrigue, assassination, the poison cup first, the leaden bullet afterward. I don't have time to go into President Lincoln's assassination. I have it up on YouTube, you can look at it. We don't have time to go into the Jesuit oath here. So we'll leave that watermelon alone and go back to Mrs. White's dream in volume one. I'd like to point out the worst part of that dream. I'm referring to these words, quote, I wept and prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. Sadly, tragically, the goods, her books, would be confiscated. The treason at the heart of the Seventh-day Adventist Church would be successful. 
Can anybody doubt that this is what we're seeing in this book, The Great Hope? If this doesn't fulfill our dream, then what does? I ask you, what does? Where else within the church are we to find so open an attack upon the great controversy? which speaks so eloquently, so powerfully, and so convincingly against the holy orders of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm asking this particularly of those of you who believe that any reference to the Jesuits while attempting to analyze what is happening within the Seventh-day Adventist Church today is paranoia or demonstrative of a shallow intellect. Conspiracy theorists is the term derisively used to describe those of us who know our history and are unafraid to bring it to God's people as we are doing today. That's why I've resurrected Adams and Jefferson. Their correspondence is for all of us, but especially for you stiff-necked, self-righteous, self-sufficient demigods who refuse to believe the spirit of prophecy. Maybe you believe two of the signers of the Declaration of Independence if you don't believe her. The great hope? No wonder some call it the great hoax. 